Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this blustery late winter's afternoon here in the western fringes of the Kruger National Park. My name is James Hendry, and this is Safari Live. And again, here we are. Brian is on camera with me today, and he has got a stick man thumb. Lovely. It's an interesting one, certainly. Uh, good. On the other vehicle today, Brent Leo Smith, he's being filmed by VM Duren Brack. They will not be live for much of the afternoon, I don't think, because they have to do some filming for some stuff that we have to do for Nat Geo Wild. That's why you were with Brent this whole, um, the whole morning. But we are on a live safari if you're wondering what this is that you've stumbled across and that means that we'd love to talk to you during the course of the next three hours. If you're on Twitter, you may talk to us using the hashtag Safari Live. Otherwise, or you can use the email questions at wildearth.tv. It is a fairly balmy, uh, sort of 29 degrees Celsius or 85, was it, degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I mean, it's the 20th of August, so we are going into the kind of springtime, but that's still pretty warm. Apparently a few fronts, the last of the winter fronts, starting to hit the country from the south in the Cape, and they'll probably hit us during the course of next week, but certainly the daytime temperatures in the absence of the fronts has started to warm up quite a lot. And it smells like August, it really does. The winds have been blowing, the dust is in the air, and it's a really exciting, expectant time of the year. You are most welcome, and we're going to see what we can find now. There were mating leopards at the pan this morning, sometime. Brent last heard them in this area, I also heard them in this area. We're going to look around here, see what we can find. We might be lucky. I know Brent did spend about two hours looking for them this morning, so they're obviously not wanting to be found, but we might be lucky. Otherwise, we'll see what else we can find, the other magical creatures of this wilderness that we're so lucky to call home. Are you ready, Brian? I'm ready. Excellent. Here we go. Hold on, everyone. <laughs> We're back to a sedate pace, because if you drive much faster than this, you're likely to miss mating leopards that are sitting in the bushes. Now, we're going to keep an eye underneath the bushes, and we're going to keep an eye on the tops of the trees, and we're going to keep an eye everywhere else. And while we are keeping an eye on everything and everyone, let's head across to Brent and get his welcome. Welcome to a beautifully warm Juma Private Game Reserve here on this wonderful Saturday evening. My name is Brent. I have the incredible VM on camera. And uh, after my dismal performance finding mating leopards this morning, I've washed my hands and sent James to the west. And I am going after lions to start the safari. No one managed to look for the Inkahumas this morning, so I'm going to go have a quick dabble in that area. But it is a wonderfully warm 29 degrees Celsius, which is about 83 Fahrenheit. It was a very warm sunrise safari starting uh, at over 70 this morning. So it is winter over. Have the hot summer month begun? Or does August have another cold spell in store for us? So because no one called in any tracks of the informer pride this morning, We've started on our eastern boundary, making sure there's no sign of them heading to visit Torchwood. So far, so good, and we've done about half of the road. Now, I think I might delve down towards Drakensberg Road and see if there are any tracks along there. Now, there is a sort of really warm wind blowing uh, sometimes those winds are referred to as berg winds. They can bring bad weather. Hopefully not. 
And when I say bad weather, I don't necessarily mean rain, which would be quite welcome. I mean uh, hot, gusting winds, dust storms and such. Now remember, we are on a live African safari. So if you would like to ask me any questions, please feel free. Questions at Wild Earth dot tv if you're an emailer or if you're a little more advanced in using the twitter sphere just use the hashtag safari live now those mating leopards gave us an incredibly difficult time last night and and the one one of the main reasons uh, was the fact that, strangely enough, it doesn't happen very often, but we were the only vehicle in over two and a half thousand acres. So uh, there were no guests, and uh, no one from Buffalzook, no one from Cheetah Plains on Juma this morning. So we had to work quite hard all by ourselves. Now, hi, Marsha. Uh, Marsha's been watching for just over a month, and she says it's very surprising that we haven't seen any rhinos. Well, Marsha, it's not that we haven't seen rhinos, it's just that you haven't seen rhinos. So unfortunately, uh, with the plight of the rhino in South Africa at the moment, and this being a live African safari, we do not put rhinos on camera. So they are here, all over the place, everywhere, and nowhere at the same time. But yes, there are rhinos here. We don't show them on the live safaris uh, as there is a very minuscule possibility that someone with nefarious intent might be watching. Hope that explains that for you, Marsha. The snoozing little Stenborki. Got him then. To the right of the dead tree, there he is. Oh, that's a really big male. Now, he's obviously an adult. Now, with Stenbock, to tell how big they are, you need to look at his horns. And if his horns are longer than his ears, he's a, a prime specimen. He's a dominant Stenbock ram. Now, of course, they also get affected by the drought, less so than a lot of the other animals. They are non-water dependent species, so they do not need to drink. They get enough moisture from dew in the mornings and from what they eat. And they will dig out tubers and little things like that to get the moisture they need. Very widespread little antelope throughout southern Africa from some very wet areas to some incredibly dry areas living all the way into the Kalahari Desert. Now they live in monogamous pairs, and there's probably a female not too far away. You can see how well his camouflage works as we zoom out. And they get their name Stienbok because they keep as still as stone as one of their defense mechanisms against predators. They just don't move. And while we go from the smallest one. Oh, actually, I think it is the smallest antelope we've seen on Safari Live. James has got the biggest. I'm not sure it's the biggest. I'm not sure that this is as big as a large wildebeest cow. That is a kudu, everyone. A kudu cow. No horns. And she is beautifully coloured for this remarkable vegetation that you see in front of us and while it is going to look very wintry for the next month or so this is the business end of the dry season and I'm always interested you know the expectation of this time of the year is such that you expect the trees to go green very quickly and the grass to do the same and it always takes rather longer than you think it's going to despite the fact that I've been in this area for more than a decade 
and um, that's certainly how I feel. Now these kudu are sitting around where we were hoping we might find the tracks of Tingana and his consort. Now I would be interested to hear from you, especially if you have a differing opinion. Apparently the consensus was that it was, this was Shadow um, that was mating yesterday evening. I saw bits of video, I saw a few blurry photographs and I certainly wouldn't be able to identify her from those but I believe that um, the, most of you believe that she was shadow and I think there are some spot patterns that you managed to find on her and so you know in the face of that sort of evidence I'm gonna go with shadow anybody have a different opinion I'd love to hear from you hashtags for live questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to tell me now off to the left a much larger group of kudu Uh, now Joyce, you're in New Hampshire and you've asked the question that demands us to deal with the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, of course, being if Shadow is mating, where is Zara, her cub? And the answer to that, Joyce, is most likely a war indeed. Uh, but we do know that Shadow has come into Estrus before the independence of her cubs before. It is not impossible that Zara is fine and that Shadow is just mating again because her cycle is uh, slightly off whack. Now, I am a slight proponent of the latter theory and that is because we know that Shadow has yet to raise a successful cub to independence. She was getting pretty close with Sandilo when he caught that dog and got rabies. Or well, he didn't get rabies, thankfully, but we thought he might. And, um, but obviously he was then taken and put into rehab. But before that, she had failed as a nine-year-old leopard to raise even one cub to independence. Now, that tells me that she's either the unluckiest leopard in the Sabi Sands, or something's amiss, and I wonder, when we saw her coming into Easter so early during Sandile's life, I think he was eight months when she first came into Easter again, that's very, very young for a male leopard to try and go independent. It's not impossible for a female, but for a male, very young. Uh, we thought maybe there was an answer there to why she hadn't had successfully raised any cubs. And, well, here she's doing it again. I mean, it's obviously not her fault. She has definitely had some bad luck, absolutely, but maybe this, this is the reason she hasn't managed to raise even one. And when you compare her with the successfulness that her mother has displayed from a very early age, well, it's difficult to think that it's purely luck. This is a magnificent herd of kudu, and they seem to be congregating more and more as the food starts to concentrate in certain areas so these herds will get slightly bigger. Action-packed kudu sighting. Look at the white tail there flicking through the bush. Monty, you want to know when these kudu are going to have their youngsters. Monty, uh, it won't be as timed as the Impala but it will certainly be semi-timed and you'll probably find that they will give birth somewhere around December time. Uh, probably between sort of November and the end of January they'll give birth to their little calves. And just a quick one there, you notice there of course the white flash of the tail. We often say that any, you know, anything white on the back end of an animal is uh, a following mechanism. You can see there how soon as she lifted her tail it was so obvious. And in this vegetation, red and orange and brown and gold and uh, sort of gingery colours blend in beautifully but white sticks out immediately. So I'm pretty sure that's why they have that white tip to the tail. Right, let's move along slowly. <laughs> wingnut, it's been some time since we spoke. I'm sure that uh, I'm wondering if you're the same wingnut. I can't imagine there are two people in the world that would have called themselves wingnut on Twitter. So, wonderful to hear from you again. Thank you for getting hold of us. <laughs> you say, which predators see in colour? And does camouflage actually work, I think, is your sort of main thrust of your question. Um, 
None of the predators out here can see in color except the avian ones. So the birds probably, a few of the bird predators will be able to see us in a semblance of color. But the whole question of camouflage is really interesting, especially at this time of the year. Sorry, one second. I thought I saw a zebra, but they did not. I did not, Brian. Don't worry. There was not a zebra there. So, wing nuts at this time of the year, the camouflage that animals have from their coloration is perfectly obvious. The kudu, the waterbuck especially, they look completely, they just disappear into this vegetation. As Brian said the other day, although in summertime the zebra looks so very obvious with their black and white stripes, when they move through this stuff, they kind of flicker in front of your eyes as though you're about to get a migraine headache. And I hope you aren't, because they're very beastly things. But that's the sort of effect that the color has in this vegetation. Then the lions, when you see them walking through this bush, they also disappear in the golden gr grass sometimes, but also amongst the leaf litter, the leopards. Yesterday we watched Karula sitting almost out in the open. But if you were watching her from a certain distance, you couldn't even see that she was there. So camouflage at this time of the year particularly important. And that, of course, wingnut is because in summertime there's green, there's stuff for animals to hide behind. So that's two aspects of the camouflage story, which is very interesting and quite a long one. Let's head across to Brent, get an update from him. We're going to do one more circle of this block. We had tracks, it looks like at least three lionesses back there. They have been driven over. I don't see them coming down Yeah, There's a possibility they're in this area to the east of us. We're going to check round towards Quarry Pan. They've been spending a lot of time in these little river systems through here. I didn't see any cub tracks though. So I'm going to loop round. If I get nothing, then I'm going to go further to the west. Maybe the cubs are still around Hyena Road, Gauri Cutline area. Very carefully. Hmm, what was that now? Was a hyena. Mm. What lion or hyena? Them? Whereabouts? So, them has spotted some tracks. Ah, there, yeah, I see them. Hi, Yusuf. Yusuf is a new viewer. Uh, Yusuf would like to know whether I am a biologist. I am not Yusuf, I'm a safari guide. So, a biologist, I go more into the science. I just like looking for animals and finding them. But we're gonna have a look here. I'm try to figure out what's going on. There's actually leopard tracks here as well. But here we go. VM spotted these tracks. And judging from the size, it's a male lion. And uh, that's his back foot, that's his front foot. Now what I really want to see is if they're cub tracks and lioness tracks around as well. Because that'll let me know that the whole pride is in this area. Now here are the cub tracks from yesterday. I know those ones, I saw those yesterday. I also want to see which way. So when you see me drag my foot like that, it means I've seen a track. 
I said, people have driven over them already today, which is makes life, life a little bit difficult. That's why I'm jumping off the car to have a look. I can see a bit more closely when I'm on foot. And when they walk on hard ground like this, it can make it quite challenging. So we've got to try and figure out, did he go right or did he go left? Hmm. Someone has driven all over my tracks. Difficult to find lions when you drive over the tracks. But there we go, so that's a male line. But yes, back to your um, question. Now, I'm not a biologist. Uh, I've grown up in the bush. Uh, so I've spent most of my life working with, in very wild areas, in lots of different countries. I just have a great love for nature and sharing nature uh, with everyone. Except for people who drive over tracks. Don't like sharing nature with them. They make my life a little bit more difficult. What we're going to do is we're going to go down into the bottom, see if we can see some tracks on the soft sand. If not, we're going to go, we're going to go off to the left. Well, Lucy in South Bend, Indiana says, I'm so good at spotting tracks. Well done, well done, VM. That's VM, I must admit, out of CamOps, is the best track spotter. And uh, we're going to keep checking down here for tracks. While we do that, let's go see what Commander Bond is up to. We're having a sense of deja vu, everybody. We came along here a little bit earlier on and we found no tracks coming in or out of this block. So I think our next plan is going to be to go towards Galigo Pan and see if we can't spot something having a drink there. I imagine given the heat of the day and the thirsty work that is mating, if you're a leopard, well, maybe they're going to be in need of something to drink fairly soon. Otherwise, I'm not really sure what they could be doing. This block is very large, and if they haven't crossed out of it, ah, they will eventually. We'll go and see what else we can find. Anyway, any other thoughts? No thoughts on whether or not it was indeed shadow? Anybody disagree that it was shadow? I'm happy to accept it was shadow. especially for those, because I think quite a few of you actually saw it happening. Monique, you're in London and wondering about the hormonal state of Shadow and whether she would, if she made it, go off and sort of leave her cub, forget about the cub. I don't know. Um, given her record, I'd say yes, quite possibly that she would forget about the cub. Um, but I'm not, you know, it's, forget about, I don't know, uh, become slightly neglectful or aggressive towards, yes, could, she could possibly. She certainly started getting aggressive with Sindile uh, very early on during her Easter cycle last time round, uh, when she, just uh, around about when she conceived Zara actually. I'm just breaking off some bark here because I'm decided I'm going to taste all of the bark that the elephants are eating at the moment. This is Peltoforum africanum, the weeping wattle. And as Brian and I read the other day as we were driving down to Cheetah Plains, it's an excellent source of forage for all animals. There you are, Brian. Uh, Brian, not, not saying that Brian's an animal, of course. I wouldn't eat it completely. I would just give it a bit of a suck. That's not good, is it? Ooh, that's terrible. Ooh. Ooh that's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> that's that is, not a good time. That's very horrible. 
Let's try the leaves, because the leaves I think are probably more the forage. No, they are eating the they're eating the bark, the elephants. There you are. Better. Mm. Mm. Not delicious though. Not delicious at all. And um, here is the evidence that they are eating the bark of the Peltoforum Africanum tree. Brian? Have I got anything in my teeth? No, it looks good. Okay, great. Excellent. Yeah. You don't want to have spinach stuck in your teeth, you know? You know what I mean? It's just it looks awful. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Well, we'll move on then. See if we can find that happens. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> on we go. Sorry about that, Louise. Louise is in final control, everybody. I can just see her shaking her head. You know, it tastes like gall. You say, what does it taste like? It's like gall. It's bitter, bitter, bitter. As soon as your tongue touches the uh, bark there, that inner bark, it's really disgusting. It's really bitter. The leaves are pretty tasteless. And they don't taste too bad. Yeah, they're fine. They're not quite as good as Zizifus, but they're not great. They're not too bad. We've got a white crown shrike up there, but now it's down on the ground. And now it is being mauled by a virtual starling. Did you see that? That is amazing. Obviously, there's some source of food there, perhaps some termites, that the poor old white crown shrike thought he'd like to eat. A virtual starling, simply on account of the fact that he's bigger, and he's now being chased off by a hornbill. So the hierarchy amongst birds that want to eat termites is determined purely by the size of the bird. Hmm, I can't see what it is that they're eating, but I'm going to assume it's termites on the ground there that have probably come out or been opened up and exposed by an animal. Strange northeasterly wind, everybody, again. These are harbingers of uh, very powerful weather, I believe. And then just have a listen. There are quite a few nice calls going on here. You're probably just going to hear the wind, but you might also hear the scimitar bill going. <whistles> In fact, Brian, you see. Mm -hmm. Top of that tree, top of the knob thorn there, there is a scimitar bill. I know that. There, you can hear it calling. I know that many of you are keeping bird lists, and a scimitar bill is not an always an easy one to get on camera. There's also a chin spot battis up there. There's a southern black tit. I can hear it going. And also a brew brew, the telephone bird. Did you see it there, or was it all behind the sticks? I think it's all behind the sticks. All behind the sticks. The one notable sound absent from this particular juncture is, of course, the sound of mating leopards. And there's the virtual starling again. I, try, I tried my hand today at the mating leopard sound, everybody. Bentley Smith is definitely the best at mating leopard sound. And Brian didn't think I did too badly. No, you did quite well. Thank you. Thank you. So Ellen Fowler, one of our resident leopard experts, says that she did not see them actually mating. Uh, so although she wanted it, Tingana seemed to be reluctant. That's quite common for him, isn't it? I mean, he, he always looks like he really couldn't be bothered until the actual um, act is performed, if you like. And Ellen, you said you thought your gut feeling was that it might be in Kanyeni. Um, uh, but even though there were a few spots matched to shadow, so that's quite interesting. What about the postulation that it could be Shiluva? Is that possible? 
She obviously, we don't know her very well, but we know she's been mating with the Mvula. We know that these leopards do often mate with two different males if they're in estrus. Could that possibly have been Shiluva? Because that would have made quite a lot of sense to me, but I obviously, I mean, definitely couldn't possibly say from what I saw uh, who it was. I keep looking on these termite mounds expectantly, hoping, but alas. And Shiluva, for those of you who don't know everybody, is a leopard that comes from the north in Biffle's Hook. And I actually don't know how old she is, I think. I think she's about five. I've actually never seen her. I saw a leopard once run across the front of the road, uh, the road in, um, on Sandy Patch, and we were all out doing a sort of a tracking evaluation. Somebody went, oh, it's Shiluva. I said, how on earth did you know that? Well, I mean, it's, it's around about where she might live. And I said, yes, yes, yes. So, <laughs> we are very good at making wild suppositions out here. That's quite fun, really, though. Wild suppositions, 99% of them are wrong, but one of them, it's the 1% that will lead to some kind of breakthrough in our knowledge. Right, we've come back to exactly the same place where we started, and we're now going to go down towards Gallego Pan, I think. We'll see what we can find there. And we're just finding out, Brent is just finding out whether the Gahumas were found this morning. And he's got one track, so let's go and find out how that tracking expedition is going. So, as I said, uh, we're still in search. Now, this looks like just the tracks of the males. So, I'm going to head a little bit further to the west. Fingers crossed that the ladies are still lounging about somewhere in a nice shady spot, getting ready for an active afternoon. So this is where those mail tracks were, but they've all been driven over. Sorry, I'm just on the radio for a second. Afternoon taxi, James went up towards Impala Plains, I did Weaver's Nest, then Gary Main, Chile Cutline. I'm working on Buffalo's Hook Dam. There's in Konzo, Wanunangala, and Yarrow at South Gory Pan. Um, there was mating anywhere. Uh, last place I heard them this morning was between power lines. Zoe's Road from Pilot Plains. I wasn't able to locate. I'm busy trying to follow up on Kovumas at the moment, but all the Nkonzo has been driven over. Um, I got Nkonzo one Nuna, Nyala Road North, uh, and Goripan Junction. The last visual of the one side here in Mampimpan last night was in the Shikova off Gauri cut line. There were three Wanuna there. I'm doing Yala Road North now. I'm going to check Hyena next. So, we're giving Taxon an update. So, he's got guests. He wasn't out this morning. So, when we give an update to someone who wasn't out on drive that morning, you generally give them a bit more of a detailed update because uh, they weren't listening to the radio in the morning. Excuse me. Afternoon, yours. Can we confirm of uh, males? Okay, copy. Thanks very much, yourself. I'm gonna. Look for the females. I'm going to check around hyena and the drainage system of Gori, uh, of Gari Kaplan. Okay, 
Okay, so this is the area where they have been spending a lot of time. The reason the Nkahoma Pride is choosing this area, there's so many of these wonderful little uh, ravines to keep the cubs in and keep the cubs safe while they go hunting. Also, it's right in the center of Nkahoma country, so it's very unlikely that they're going to bump into any marauding lions. So it's far from the peripheries where there might be females that aren't related to them or males coming in. Oh, sorry, madam. Didn't see you up there. That female could be right on top of this termite mound next to us. Suddenly looked up and there was a kudu looking down at me. Here we go. Aubrey, what do you got for the months? Copy, thanks. Oh yeah, so that it is quite windy and blustery, so a lot of the prey species are going to be a bit, a bit jumpy. This sunset safari. Hmm, where are oh, where are the lions hiding? I'm sure the kudu don't know. Liam, do you know? Underneath the bushes. Yes, I think that's a very good answer. Underneath which, which bush exactly is what I'd like to know. So chatting about tracking Celia and Isaac would like to know what are the most common tracks we see. Well those would generally belong to the most common antelope, the Impala are the most common tracks out here. Um, and along with all the herbivores, elephant tracks very common, buffalo, kudu, zebra. Now of course all the prey species or herbivores occur at higher numbers than the predators. So there's always going to be more tracks of the other animals than lions, leopards. Uh, well, out of the predators, the track we see the most often is probably a hyena. As they patrol biggest distances every night. And another one of the more common little nocturnal mammals tracks that we see is the African civet. Okay, Inkahumas, enough of this dilly dallying. Hi, Rachel in Virginia. Rachel says, is it scary to ride around in an open vehicle knowing there are lions around? Uh, Rachel, it is not at all. Uh, it's quite exciting, actually. Uh, well, Rachel, the, being in an open vehicle and close to lions and stuff makes about as no difference as it compared to being in a closed vehicle. The benefit that an open vehicle gives us is we're able to see everywhere. I don't have any stuff in my way and so can the camera move. But even if you notice the safari vehicles, the other lodges use are all open. Uh, there's almost zero danger as long as you drive carefully and respectfully around the animals and read their behavior correctly. That's why, well, with an open vehicle, uh, you normally have an experienced safari guide to drive you around. And it makes for a far more pleasant experience uh, when you've got someone in the front of the vehicle who knows what the lions are going to do before they do it. Uh, reads their body language and, that, and that's a lot of what we do, especially when uh, lions actually pose far less a threat than something like elephants. And so reading the elephant's body language, knowing what herd's safe to approach closely, what herd's not, uh, when an animal's in a heightened hormonal, a heightened stress situation. Now, of course, that is all comes with a lot of time and experience, but it is, less dangerous driving around out here in the African bush with all the lions and elephants than it is crossing any major street in a large city. Well, joy to the world. It looks like no one has driven down this road this morning, so hopefully if there are tracks, uh, they will be unspoiled. Oh, you 
hiding kitty cats. While we keep in search of some of Juma's big cats, uh, let's go see how James's search for the evil hiding leopards is going. And they are slightly evil, I have to admit. Uh, Taxon has just come past. He has a tracker on the front of his vehicle called Fanotti. And with any luck, they will, they're going to do the same loop that we've just done and just see if I haven't perhaps missed some tracks, which is entirely possible. Uh, we're going to go down towards the pan, as I said. So, not much else going on. We had a very nice sighting of a crested barbet while you were with Brent. Unfortunately, the bird was too far away for this lens. Let's go and just look in the clearings here where there are some impala who are looking unfortunately relaxed. So no further thoughts on Shiluva, everybody, whether that was, might have been her or not. Now, when I heard them once this morning, I, Brian and I heard them once this morning, and I thought they were in here somewhere. But these Impala do not indicate from their generally relaxed uh, dispositions that they have heard any mating leopards in this vicinity. All right, let's just go around the corner here. Right, Raisa from Finland, another one of our resident experts. While we look at this bachelor herd of impala with one solitary little you there, that's interesting. Uh, you say, Raisa, and thank you for getting hold of us again. It's been a while since we've heard from you, a bit like with Wingnut. Uh, you say that you have not, you didn't watch the morning safari, but you did catch the video of the two leopards at the dam cam, and you say, without a doubt, it's shadow. I tend to agree with you, and unfortunately, I think that probably means that her cub is a war indeed, and if not now, well, probably quite soon. Anyway, time will tell. We might be quite wrong. It not, will not be the first time we've been proved wrong. One of these Impala, unfortunately he's walked off now, has obviously got only one horn, and that is because he has been fighting over ladies. There he is. What on earth was that? There's a bird on a nest here somewhere that these impala nearly stood on and that's what made them jump. <laughs> I'm sure it's one of those Senegal lapwings. Let's just look. Right about, right about where that one's eating there, Brian, the one closest to us is where that bird started yelling. Somewhere on the ground there, I suspect, a Senegal lapwing of having a nest. I can't actually see it. That is not surprising. A Senegal lapwing has an extremely hidden nest. Quite tempted to go and have a look. You can have a quick look. You go and have a quick look, everybody. The Impala will run away, don't worry. They will come back as and when they want to. I will do so in a very non-predatory fashion so that they do not panic. But they will move off, they will move outside of the flight distance. Now just look on the ground here. Oh, there's, there's much running around. That's actually quite beautiful. I thought they would just move off quietly. They have actually decided that they are deeply panicked by my physique. Now the bird started yelling round about here. There it is. Is it? Yes, it is. It's not a lapwing, it's a bronze-winged courser. Now, Brian, you see this tuft in front of me here? I don't want to disturb it. Now, the tuft in front of me, just in front of it, there's a bronze winged courser. That's the second one I've spotted. And I think she's on a nest. 
Can you see her? If I come forward, we'll be able to see her. She's... <laughs> she... Can you see her at all? <laughs> How cool is that? I've never seen a bronze winged corsa nest. We'll just go a little bit forward. I think we'll get a better angle from there. That is fantastic. That is so cool. It's my second nest of the season, Brian. You can call me Scott Dyson if you like. That is so amazing. There, you can see her or him. There, you got him there. A big tuft of grass there, there we are. Can you believe it, everybody? There is a bronze winged courser. They are beautiful birds. Very subtly coloured, but with those red, the red on their beaks and red around their eyes. And there's another one that I spotted first before I saw that one. I'm just trying to see if I can see it again. I can't, you know, I don't know where it is. It was slightly further back. And I'm really quite impressed with myself for spotting that, I have to tell you. I'm not known for my spotting skills. Brilliant. Well, we shall watch that nest with great interest over the coming weeks and months. <laughs> just zoom out there and just show everybody how impossible, unless you nearly stood at stand on the bird, which I nearly did, that is to see. You'd never see that. You would never know that there were two ground-dwelling, nocturnal, coursing birds sitting in this clearing. And they just gave those impala a warning, and the impala very kindly moved off. <coughs> before they ran away at the sight of me. Rather insulted by that. All right, let's leave the bronze-winged courser to itself and continue on our merry way. While we do that, let's get an update from Brent and with his lion tracking, I think. Here we go. Some uh, pajamaed horses or striped donkeys, depending on what you prefer. Now we're going to be seeing a lot of them as we move towards October. It is very, very dry. And they're moving. They're moving up, or moving in from the Manuleti and from the Western Kruger. Now they're bulk grazers trying to eke out an existence in this very dry, dry, dry crest. But. The lion tracking is not is going pretty much like the leopard tracking went this morning. Uh, we've got tracks of some of the lionesses heading into an impenetrable area between Buffalo's Hook Dam and Hyena Road, but no tracks of the cubs. So I'm going to try and make my way towards the last position of the cubs, see if they might have been left overnight. So we, we actually get asked this relatively often um, with about all animals that have stripes, spots, squares and squiggles. And Sienna's asking about zebra. Will a zebra fold take on its mother's stripes? Uh, no, it will not. Just like a leopard will not take on its mother's spots. So each individual zebra, each individual leopard is a complete unique individual. And uh, it is impossible to try uh, gauge mother and daughter or mother and son judging on their stripes. Um, a lot of people see patterns that they think are similar but unfortunately it's been scientifically proven many many times with many many species that that is not possible. The only way to actually identify uh, <laughs> a mother and daughter or mother and son when it comes to zebra would uh, be through genetics. 
No. Especially because they live in a harem and they'll just sort of mingle into one eventually. Okay. I'm going to try to see. This is the area where the cubs were left or where the cubs were. I saw last saw the cubs on yesterday's sunset safari. So maybe they're still in this little river system here. Unfortunately, the majority of this little river system is impenetrable by vehicle. Very steep ravine. That's what makes it a really great place for the lions to leave their cubs. It's unlikely that many other predators would feel the need to wander into those very steep ravines. It's unlikely that they're going to find any, in, any food there. Okay. Of course. We have been able to sometimes find our way into the bottom of these ravines with some, uh, how would you put that, Jim? Technical driving or determined driving? One of the two, I'm not sure. Just having a quick look. Tamay is wondering, has a lioness ever given me a look when I've been too close to cubs? Uh, Tamay, I would say one step beyond a look. Oh, it's a little diker. Oh, it was a little diker. Uh, Tamay, I have been charged by a lioness and she stopped so close uh, when she was growling and snarling at me. I had lion spit stuck all over my leg here. And I've had uh, almost the exact same with male lions before. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. I can think of only three serious charges I've stood down on foot. Um, most of the time it's a very... Uh, they normally growl before you get too close. But sometimes when the wind is up... Oh, oh Aubrey's just giving me a call. I'll tell you now, so just get up the steep hill. Standing by. FM Orbs, uh, we lost lost them in the block between Zoe's and Parlor Road and uh, the fire break. We had audio, but we didn't manage to locate them. Okay, sorry, Orbs is just wondering about the leopards we do not speak of that kept us busy all morning. But yes, yeah, so I've been charged. Uh, the, probably the scariest charge I've ever faced. Uh, was from two male lions uh, who are part of a pride of lions in the Kruger National Park who are quite famous for man-eating. <laughs> uh, and so what happened is we were tracking the mountain pride. There was a Nat Geo documentary made on them called when they were called the Mega Pride. And Glass Maramane, who was my track at the time, him and I parked the vehicle set off over after the tracks now there's a very simple rule when you're dealing with lions on foot noisy lion safe lion quiet lion dangerous lion so if a lion snarling growling <laughs> slapping the ground trying to it's telling you too close go away a lion comes quickly it's a different story <laughs> uh, and uh, so glass and i went through a little river system like this following the tracks we came out to a big flat open area on the other side and we spotted the lions and normally when you spot the lions at a distance about 80 meters away they normally lift their heads up growl maybe try to sneak away but they had some new males in that pride who had come up from northern Kruger where their area is very famous for man-eating of the Mozambican immigrants trying to cross into into South Africa and these two males got up 
and they just came straight, not a sound. And uh, my track out glass, she said, shoot, shoot, shoot them. Um, I, of course, did not want to shoot a lion inside a national park. So I said, oh, I'm for like my rush. Throw rocks at them was my reply. Uh, we uh, stood our ground and uh, we started shouting. We might have used some bad words while we were shouting at this point. And those male lines stopped. Oh, I don't know. So, those male lines stopped. We were standing about here. So this is where we're standing. One, two, three. That's where the male lines stopped. And as they stopped, I mean, they're coming at about 90 kilometers an hour. You just imagine that stop. All that dirt and stuff just whacked into us, this cloud of dust. I was, had the rifle loaded and low, and um, Glass was standing next to me, picking up any little bit of rock and throwing at them. So the most important thing is not to run in those situations. If we had run, we would have been eaten, uh, and put it that way. And when you carry a rifle, if an animal really wants to hurt you, you don't have any time to do anything. I mean, the only reason I had time to chamber around is because they stopped. If they'd kept coming, I would have been halfway through loading the rifle and I would have been bowled over. The only reason we survived is because we didn't run. Uh, it took us about half an hour to get out of that situation. So if you work with a tracker and a very good tracker, you've got to have incredible trust. So I've got a loaded rifle up against my shoulder like this. What he does is he slips his finger through the back of your belt and he leads you backwards. So you can't take your eyes off the line and in case you step over a log or whatnot, he'll warn you. And uh, so it took us about 20 minutes. Every time we'd take a step, they would go, Bruh! and uh, this was all going on. The guests were not that far away. They were about, probably about 100 meters away. Can you imagine you're on your first African safari from America? All we can hear is your guide screaming, what's up? Beep, 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 beep. And uh, it's someone else shouting in some African language uh, and the lion's going, Bruh! so um, we had earpieces at Singita like this. So the one lady grabs the radio and goes, Oh my God, oh my God, my ranger's been eaten by a lion. Of course, now she doesn't know why no one's answering her because all the sound's coming through here. And uh, there was complete panic. Vehicles start driving from all over the reserve up to the north where we were. And um, by about 20 minutes, we got back there. Completely fine. Absolutely, both of us, Glass and myself, were 100% fine. And then I unloaded the rifle, pushed the rounds back, made the rifle safe put the rifle back in the gun rack and then I just started, my hands just started going and I, and I was trying to get into the car and I kept doing this. I could not and Glass was doing the same thing on the other side. But yeah, that was probably the scariest lion charge I've ever faced because it started off quietly. So, but the wonderful thing about those situations is you learn so much from them. I'm just listening to the radio. Okay, so there we go. I hope that answers you about the lion story. I just want to have a quick peer. Okay, let's have a look. This is where the cubs were. So let's see if we can have a look over that cliff see if there's not a cub sleeping in the bottom of this. This is where they were yesterday. Anything down there, Vim? Oh, there's a lion log. A beautiful light on a piece of dry wood. You see that one, Vim? Um, no, oh, let me go forward a bit. See the one that looks like it could be a lion. There we go. Beautiful light shining off of a dry piece of wood. And I think they have moved the cubs from here. I think we would have seen some little heads pop up if we had off-roaded. Right, so, no lions. Which leads me to believe that they are in that block between Buffalo's Hook Dam and Hyena Road. A very, very difficult area. Now, strangely enough, I have never been charged by the Nkuma Pride and I've walked them many, many times on foot. Uh, I have been half growled at once. Uh, it is abnormal to be charged by lions 
uh, if you're walking them during the day, 99.9% .9 of the time, they'll try and move away from you. Now, although it's the same principle with leopards, quiet leopard, dangerous leopard, noisy leopard, safe leopard, when they're charging. We used to have a, a male leopard called the, uh, they called, he had a couple of different names. The bicycle crossing male was one. Uh, we used to know him as Shorty or the short tailed male. He was the, uh, because his mom only had half a tail, uh, he just inherited the name. He had a full length tail. But he was either, he was a very strange leopard. He was sometimes he'd just lie on a turn around and look at you while you tracked him. Other times he would charge you. Now a leopard is faster than a lion and it charges from a much closer distance. And uh, what would happen, we'd be tracking him through a little river system like this. And then all of a sudden, the bush around you would turn into a roaring jumbo jet. And he, his favorite thing is he'd charge you from one side, stop a meter from you, then run behind you, charge you from behind. And then again and again, all you had to do was just stand there until he was finished. You just go lie down like dump and look at you. I was like, I told I, I taught you, now you're not gonna do that again. But yeah, uh, he was always fun to walk, the short-tailed male. Now, in a vehicle, a uh, leopard we used to see quite regularly when I first started uh, was Kunyuma. But strangely enough, he never charged me once on foot and I walked him many, many times. Um, he used to like charging cars. Maybe got a big, bigger kick out of it. Okay, so no sign of the lions coming over this way. There are maybe there will be some Ellie's heading towards the Juma waterhole. That would be quite pleasant. I feel like I haven't got my fair share of elephant fixes for the last while. Chanel says she loved the story, Brent versus charging lions and freaked out tourists. Yes. Uh, the one little part I did forget to mention what happened. So quite often on safari you'll have, uh, at Singhisi you only have a maximum of six people on your safari vehicle. And they're normally couples from different places. And uh, we had four Americans and, and two, two Poms or, or Brits. And uh, the one Brit, she had quite a good sense of humor. Uh, once we got into the vehicle and I managed to... Quick link to James. This way to the left here. Okay. Everybody, we don't know what we've seen here. It's got spots, it's got yellow skin. We thought it was a leopard. Whatever it is, it's quite shy. We've been bashing through here trying to find it and I'm just hoping that we're going to get another view so that we can confirm exactly what it is. Could be a serval. Just saw it slinking through here. We've done a long loop through the bush. We thought we might catch up with it and then we did. But we haven't actually managed to get it on camera yet. Just heard the bird's alarm calling. That's what attracted me to the area. And then I looked in and I just saw these spots slinking through and I assumed it was a leopard. You'll excuse me not making eye contact with you while I talk, but we just need to try and see. Brian then got a spot of it here. I've seen it twice. What it is. We just thought we'd better come bring you across here because if we only get one more view, we want you to see it. Brian, you saw it walking down through here, did you? <laughs> I just assumed it was a leopard, but it might well not be. Let's just listen for the birds. Birds have stopped calling. I think whatever it is has gone to ground. We 
It could be a cheetah. Right, here comes Aubrey. I'm just going to quickly get hold of him. Sorry everyone, I maybe have dragged you away from Brent for no reason because... You see, you can't hear anything, can you, Brian? No. Mm -hmm. And it's so thick in here. Orbs, do you copy? I'm just calling Aubrey, everyone. Oh, what's your position? Orbs, I've got one more view where I am here. I'm just north of your position. I don't know that it was a leopard. It may have been a cheetah. Uh, but it, whatever it was, was quite shy. We got one more view and then it moved off again. We're going to keep trying in here. So, Aubrey said he saw two monkeys on in some trees close by. I think we need to keep moving like we did back then. Where this thing's gone, I'm not sure. All right, now everybody, you're going to come. You're going to come with us on this expedition to see if we can find whatever it was, because Brent's doing his National Geographic filming stuff. So there's going to be a little. Mm, there's going to be a little bit of noise. That's okay, because I'm just fascinated to know what it is we've seen in here. So come along on the adventure. Excuse the noise. And with any luck, we'll get a little view of whatever it was. You okay there, Brian? We'll do our best not to lose Brian off the back. And it was just walking very quietly, but the fact that as soon as we came off road, I couldn't see it anymore, indicated to me that whatever it was is perhaps a little bit nervous of the vehicles. But maybe not. This will be incredibly frustrating if we don't see it again because mainly because I'm not I don't know what it was. It had yellow fur and spots. That's all I can tell you. Right, Brian? So we'll just have a look around here, I think, for the next fifteen minutes or so. And then we'll go and see what else we can see. Elephants have made such an unspeakable mess in here that it is almost impossible to move without making a horrendous noise. Which, if you're looking for a slightly nervous animal, makes things very difficult. Watch heads, everyone. No thorns. They certainly are, James Richard. You say the spotted cats are supplying us with many mysteries today. Absolutely they are. And we're being followed, we're being trailed as we speak by a fork-tailed drongo that is looking for the whatever sort of invertebrates get kicked up by our movements through the bush here in the same way that they would follow a herd of buffalo or elephants. So, Brian, you reckon it turned on and came down this way, hey? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I through there. These trees will pop up, most of them, everyone. You can see the one in front of us has been run over before. We won't get through here, of course, because the elephants have since placed a lot rock in the way. Yeah, 
now, I'm afraid I think we've just been lucky. Hello, Dina. You're suggesting I use my intuition rather than trying to chase it down and uh, befall on it using intuition to come out. Well, I can certainly try and do that. I don't really think we're chasing it down so much as looking carefully in the bushes for it. But I take your point. Hello, Nisha in North Carolina. You're wondering about whether a serval is fast like a cheetah. No, nothing like. A serval is half the size of a cheetah, quarter the size of a cheetah. And they just, they sort of uh, hunt small rodents. Um, a cheetah, no, don't travel together normally, especially if it's a female. She'll be on her own. The males form little coalitions of brothers sometimes. But they don't travel together by default. They're solitary, the females. And I don't think this one had any babies. I truly don't know what it was. I just saw it slinking off into the bush. We came through, then we got one more view of it. Did you think it was a leopard? I don't know. No. Yeah. I just saw it slinking. It's over. very it's odd. You could see yeah. The shoulder blades moving. It's a cat. It's a cat, definitely. Anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Let's head out. I think we're going to... Yeah, this is Aubrey. No, nothing, Orbs. Uh, it's very thick in here. I think let's make our way back out onto the road and see if we aren't lucky. And we might have to go and see what else we can find. <laughs> we can go down to... I went down to the Gallagher Pan. That's why we're in this area. And I just wonder... You right there, Brian? I just wonder if we don't go back there, whether it won't have left some tracks that will give us some kind of indication as to what it was. Unspeakable noise. Let's keep looking, everybody. Keep looking from side to side. We could be lucky. It might not be. And Mary, you're wondering how often we come across serval or other smaller cats on drive. Really, Mary, not very often at all. Uh, we've seen serval probably, I don't know, maybe a handful of times. I've seen them twice. I think Brent's seen them, Brian's seen them twice. They're actually probably of the small cats, the ones we do see the most. African wild cat, I think we've had one decent sighting of. Jamie had a good sighting of them for about two hours, but still only one individual. Um, and Caracal, I don't think they've ever... Has Caracal ever been seen on Safari Live? I don't think they have. In theory, they could er exist here, but I'm not sure they've ever been seen. No, everyone, I'm afraid not. We can't keep bashing through here all day long, so I think we'll have to go out onto the road. <laughs> I can't believe it. Ah, what a pity. Hello, Adam. You think our eyes are playing tricks on us? <sighs> You're probably right. Let's go to the pan, see if we can't find some tracks. But before we do that, actually, let's go up. Let's go a little bit up the road here. Just see if whatever it is hasn't popped out onto the road. It's just in here somewhere. And Brian spotted it first, at least second, as it was going through here, just before you came live, and I thought, here we go, we're going to have a sighting. But relax and relax. Nothing. I'm 
just going to go up here where, to where the drainage line crosses. Let's see, while we were in there, it didn't pop out. Moving the other way, do you think? Yeah. So it might turn and come this way. Its original direction was this way. The reason I it was immediately struck by how I thought maybe it wasn't a leopard was the fact that they don't normally move through thick bush like that unless they are kind of hunting and cheetahs will do exactly what that thing did. Leopards stick to game paths because they find it easier. Cheetahs will avoid game paths. That's Aubrey just up in front of us. Now, I I'm afraid I think we're going to give this up. Let's just quickly have a chat with Aubrey. Aubrey, nothing there. Yeah, sorry man. It, I think it was nervous. It ran off. what road this is. We might just drive along it briefly. Uh, Taxon is in there already. Oh, he's coming back out though. Tax confirm nothing that side. Yeah, I heard it, Jim. Can't see anything. Yeah, he's got nothing there. Sorry about that everybody. We're gonna have to go and find something else. Sorry, Brian. It's okay, Jay. I'm also sorry. I'm glad that you saw it, though, because otherwise people would think that I was going stark raving loony. Yes, I think both of us are. Yeah, about your side. Kathy, you say the sides of Wendy and Rusty and Jigger are quite sort of um, destroyed from our efforts, yes, they don't look great. Uh, you wouldn't want to arrive at a gala dinner uh, in one of these cars. Listen. No, I couldn't tell, Tex. I'm just hearing birds alarm call again. That's how we found it originally. It just slunk so cat-like through the bush. Oh. Okay, let's go back to the water hole, see what we can find there, and then we'll move on from there. There might be one or two buffalo there. Perhaps an elephant will come down and have a drink. He's got tracks. Tracks of a male leopard Taxon's got. I don't think that was a male leopard, I think it was too big. Copy that, uh, fresh. No, he says they're relatively fresh. So they were in here. Sorry, Luis Ego again with that question. <laughs> Hello, Nisha, North Carolina. You've seen us eating various bits and pieces. Um, you say, have we ever eaten anything that's made us sick out here? Um, I haven't, Brian, have you? Now we're very, I'm actually very careful about what we do eat and if I've never seen an animal eating it and I don't know what it is, then I won't touch it. These aren't the mating pair in here, because now Taxon's got male and female tracks. <laughs> Deborah, you say you get worried with us pushing bushes into our mouths all the time. Um, Deborah, 
like I say, I'm very careful about which ones we eat. It's never a good idea to go into the wilderness, especially if you are a younger viewer. Don't go into the wild and eat something you cannot identify. Um, all these ones, we have I mean, I know the trees of this area pretty well, and if I don't know a tree, I won't put it in my mouth. We're very careful about it. Now, Taxon has got female leopard tracks as well, and male. Maybe it's the pair that came down to have a drink here. I'm going to look at the road here quite carefully, but we're going to listen. And we're just listening to Aubrey. So, Aubrey's saying he's got tracks. Let's go to where we saw her cross the road, or it, whatever it happened to be. As we came round this corner, I heard the birds' alarm calling, and Brian and I were chatting, and looked in there and saw this thing slinking through. Now, let's see if we can't find a track. And it was right in there. Exactly where you're looking now. And we couldn't go off the road here, so we went round the corner, and by the time we got into the bush, she was gone. Or he, or it, whatever it was. I've come back to the road to Galago Pan. Hello, Cat and Tambi. You're wondering if um, if uh, Herbert isn't around to help us. I wish he was. Unfortunately, he's had to go home. He's got a he's got a tummy bug, so he's gone home to recuperate. And absolutely, he would be the ideal man to have in this job, because he could walk through there. He could spot the tracks far more efficiently than I'm able to. Anyway, I'm, let's go straight to the water hole see if there isn't something else going on there. Maybe that was the female, she was wandering through there, she left the male. I just don't think it was a leopard though. The more and more I think about it, the less leopard-like I think it was. Oh well, Tax and Aubrey are in the area, they've both got trackers, so... I mean, if there's something here that we could have seen, I've no doubt they will find it if we can get to it in a vehicle. This block, as you've seen, is rather hellish for driving through. And that is why, and it's another wonderful lesson as to why the ears are so very important out here. We only found it because of the animal's alarm calling at it. Here are some beefaloes. Here are many, many beefaloes. Oh, it's a bachelor's convention, Brian. It's a lovely soundtrack in the background there, isn't it? It is. It's the sound, everybody, of ceilings being put into the DRC. <laughs> oh, let's just stop and have a little listen here while we enjoy these buffalo. There's, our, there's the fellow there. Just look at him. Now, I was very kindly sent a message from somebody on Twitter about who that fellow looks like, because I couldn't remember. And it's a character. And I'm going to look quickly now. There's a picture of it. Hang on one sec, everyone. Look at him. He, you see how he looks like he's whited out his face? Let me see if I can find it again quickly. It's very funny. You can see he's lost his horn, poor fellow. Oh, and he's not surprised he's lost his horn given the amount of tree he's breaking with them. I think I'm nearly there. Hang on, just keep keep patient everybody. Enjoy the look of him. 
now. I can't find it anymore and I've forgotten the name. I said he looked like... <laughs> he looked like that character from Live and Let Die in um, a James Bond film and looked like he belonged in a... Oh, there are more birds alarm calling here. He looked like he belonged in a New Orleans carnival, I thought. You see him there? I just want to quickly see if we can't find the picture while we're waiting here. It's a good idea to just sit and listen for a little while. No, I can't find it, I'm afraid. Never mind. Okay, let's go around the corner now and see if we can't get a sight of whatever it is that those birds are alarm calling at. There are two or three species of bird alarm calling here. It's exactly what I heard when we saw the other thing. <laughs> whatever it was. Ooh, there's much crossness in these birds. Hello, you funny looking fellow. Can you hear all the birds, everyone? They're deeply upset about something. Yes, I think um, <laughs> Louise makes a very good point. She says she looks a bit like a French mime and he's going to get stuck in a transparent mud wallow just now. <laughs> Very good, Louise. That's very, that's very amusing. I can't see anything popping out of the bushes here that is, it might be spotted. Let's keep going. There. Something running through the bush here. It may have just been a Franklin. I suspect quite strongly it was. Oh, it's a diker. Fantastic. Look at that. Genius. Brian, we've solved the mystery. Hurrah. We have found the diker. Let's go home and celebrate. We can rest easy. Yes. Hooray. Hooray. Yippee. go around the corner here. I'll tell you how often it has been that we have thought we were going to see amazing things on the back end of what's been seen at the damn camera. The back end of alarm calls and tracks all over the place and we drive around and see trees. There is still much shouting amongst the birds. That's alarm calling, definitely. It's Battis' alarm calling. Let's just wait here for a second. See if something doesn't pop out. It's also very strange, Brian. Quite a rhythmic hammering that, isn't it? It's lovely. It's wonderful. Hmm. No. You know what? I'm going to stick my head over the top there. Now, everybody, I'm going to leave you. Don't be afraid. You're going to stay with me. What I'm going to do is put my head over the top there and see if there isn't something there that those birds are shouting at. You should still be able to hear and see me. Well, unless, of course, I'm uh, mauled by something. So fear not. I'm going to be very quiet now.
I'm not sure. Can you hear me, Brian? I'm just not sure that that diker would have come running down here if it had spotted a predator. Still got me, Brian? Uh, I cannot see anything through here. I can see the birds. I can see the battises. Still got me? It might be that they're just shouting at the deeply offensive noise being made by the builders. But I see nothing through here, everyone. The mystery continues. Still got me? It's astounding. Good news. All right, I think we should go around to the Juma Dam, Pan, see what we can find there. What I didn't want to do was step over the top of the hole that was over here. I to have avoided that successfully. Less and lack. Keep an eye on the ja on the damn pan throughout the day. There's something going on here. Something's going on. All right, let's go and see what else we can find. Righty. Matthew, you're wondering about whether it's difficult or different, I think, to travel through the bush at different times of year. It's very different, Matthew. It's different on account of the fact that the bush never looks the same two months or one month to the next. And I think Brian would back me up here when I say that whenever we go away on leave and we come back two weeks later, everything always looks different. There's some hyena tracks here, but they're not very fresh. Uh, so, yeah, Matthew, it's never the same. This is the best game viewing time. You know, you're going... People often say, when should we come across here? What's the best time of the year to come? There isn't a best time. But if you want to... I mean, the, the easiest game viewing time, possibly the least attractive in the bush time, is this. So you see the most game when there are no leaves on the trees, when it's all kind of uh, sticks and grey and a bit of gold and copper, then that's the best time of the year to come and see animals because the bush is so much more open than it is at any other time of the year. But it's also quite harsh. If you're not used to it, it's quite a harsh look to it. And then in summertime, Matthew, it's green and very beautiful and verdant and very thick, which means it's very easy for the animals to hide, even easier than it has been for whatever it is that we just saw. And nobody has found a cat today. It's all been rather quiet on the cat front. <laughs> Cat in Tampa, a good question from you. Uh, you say, could that hammering be scaring the cats away? I don't think so, no. I mean, I, you know, they're so used to that camp. That camp's been built there, and there are repairs done almost on a daily basis. So, I mean, there's often noise in the camp. We often see leopards around the camp. So, no, I don't think it's frightening them away. It's frightening me away, definitely. But it's certainly not frightening the cats. And it's funny, I mean, the reason we're putting the ceilings in, of course, is because it's so hot in summer. And so those tin roofs, uh, were a bit sort of oven-like last year, wasn't it, Brian? It was very ovenish. Horrifying. Hor horrifyingly ovenish. Now, there are some nyalas. Let's just have a stop and look at them. Female Nyala. We're just listening carefully. 
and enjoying the atmosphere. Very pleasant wind now. It's swung to the southeast, which tells me that those fronts that have been battering the Cape are now making their way up here. So I think we won't have a warm 29 degrees tomorrow. I'll probably be proved completely wrong. Sorry, I'm just listening to the radio. I heard uh, somebody say that Tingana and Shadow had crossed over Gari Main into Hoffman's. That's interesting. I'm just listening now. <clears throat> Sounds like they've crossed everyone. There's a lovely little herd of Nyala coming down. Sounds like they've crossed out. That's very interesting. Okay, well, let's go and see what else we can find. It's quite a cool breeze now coming out of the southeast. Hello, Rachel. You're wondering if I have any wild stories of being attacked by animals in the bush. Um, not really. Uh, <laughs> Rachel, I try to avoid being attacked by animals in the bush by, as a rule of thumb, um, I find being attacked by animals deeply unpleasant. But there have been times when I've got a little bit too close to animals and we had an experience just two days ago, Rachel, I think it's your daughter I'm talking to, nine years old, and Rachel's daughter, aged nine, we had an incident two days ago, Viam and I, we were sitting on Cheetah Plains and we were watching an elephant cow and she didn't seem to like us very much. She started flicking her leg from side to side. You know how when you go to school and maybe you meet a new person or your teacher shouts at somebody and so you, you get a little bit nervous and you start fiddling with your pen or your crayon or perhaps you start playing with your shirt. That's what the elephant was doing. So she was moving her leg up and down as if to say, I'm not very comfortable with you. And then as we drove past her, she turned around and she went, and she started running straight towards us. So we drove off very quickly and she chased us down the road. And it was very scary indeed, but we managed to get away. But the whole message of that story, Rachel, and Rachel's daughter, age nine, is that we made the animal feel afraid in some way. We don't really know how we made that happen. But that's the only time that an animal will try and chase you, only when it feels afraid. And we don't know why that animal was afraid, but because she was afraid, she chased us. Anyway, those are the kind of situations you do get into. But although they make nice stories to tell everyone, they are not stories that necessarily, um, well, sometimes they're a bit sad, really, because it means that you've made an animal feel sad or the animals felt threatened by you. And so while they're exciting stories to tell, they're always tinged for me with a little bit of kind of, gee, I wonder why they did that. I wonder why they felt so threatened that they decided to chase us. And I've had one or two incidents with leopards and their cubs. And leopards and wild dogs. The leopard jumped onto the car. And that was very scary indeed. My guests all thought it was part of the show. It wasn't. They nearly died. They didn't realize. <laughs> now, this is where the Inkahumas were last time we saw them. Hmm. Diva, you're wondering if leopards are more aggressive when they're mating. I imagine they are, absolutely. I think the uh, action of mating probably raises the testosterone levels that a male leopard has and testosterone is going to result in a heightened aggression. The females I think are so, I mean it's difficult to say, you know, you've seen leopards mating before. They are so uh, filled with hormones, they're so driven to try and mate 
that I think, yes, they probably are possibly uh, slightly more likely to give you what we call a rev, so to maybe give you a bit of a chase. But you know you hear them when they're mating, you hear her growling at him and you hear them making that sound when they do it. And so you can kind of stay away from them. I've never walked into a pair of leopards by mistake. I've heard them on foot and gone back and found them in the car, but I've never actually sort of stumbled on them. So I couldn't tell you if they were that much more angry than they would be normally. I'm going to do a brief look up here, and then I think we're going to go back down towards the south to where we last saw Karula. Because no one knows where she is. Everyone from this end of the world has now gone north into Biffle's Hook, so we're on our own over here. They were all coming this way to hopefully see Tingana and Shadow in the throes of their passion. I think let's turn around here. Unless, let's not turn around here. Let's go around to Hyena Road and see if we aren't lucky that side. Now the last time we saw the, saw the Birmingham boys and those cubs, they were underneath a bush there, that bushel, and the cubs were down in the drainage line down the other side, almost impossible to see. I don't think it's worth having a look in there because that was two days ago. So let's continue to the top of this road here. <laughs> and Lucia, you're interested in funny stories that I might have had while on drive with guests. Well, Lucia, ooh, there's a batelier. Almost fully adult plumage, just not quite young Miss Batelier. You can see a female. And now you can see the great blue African sky <laughs> as the batelier flew away. Lucia, by far the most varied, most hilarious, and most astonishing creature on planet Earth, of course, is the human being. And so I have got hundreds of stories about guests that have done strange things. Uh, many of them, of those stories, are in the books that I wrote, because people used to say, you have to write a book about this stuff, you can't believe that people behave like this. And they do. And so I did write two books about it, and the books are not about, they're called, you know, the first one's called The Year in the Wild, and it's about being in the bush, but it's not the animal stories that make people want to read them, it's the behavior of the human beings that you come across that make you want to uh, just sort of cringe and disown uh, members of your own species. I'm trying to think of a uh, some particularly outlandish ones. My favorite one, my favorite story ever of two guests were some New Yorkers who came out here. I don't know why they came out here, but dad didn't want to be here. Mum and son were absolutely terrified to the point of being catatonic just about. They're very sweet people and there was a son and I don't remember him saying one word in the three days that I looked after them. And not the son, the daughter. I don't remember the daughter saying a thing in the three days that I looked after them. And one night we were driving home trying to find something to look at and we saw a chameleon. And many of you would have seen a chameleon with us. And Johnson, who was the tracker, he was fantastic. He shone the light on the chameleon and he said in his extremely deep voice, he said, Chameleon. So I said, look everybody, there's a chameleon. And... <laughs> They said from the back of the car, they said, Mrs. Mrs. said, what should we call them? We'll call them, um, I don't know, we'll, let's just call them Smith for now. Mrs. Smith said, why you're stopping? I said, well, because there's a chameleon over there. She said, oh my God, is it poisonous? So I said, uh, no, no, uh, Judy, it's, it's not poisonous at all, it's a chameleon. It uh, changes color, it's a really interesting thing. And before I could get any further into my explanation of the astonishing biology of the flat-necked chameleon, 
Judy said the following. Oh my God, there's a snake. There's a snake. Drive, drive. It's coming this way. I said, Judy, hold on. And uh, Johnson says to me, it's a branch. She says, it's not a branch. It's a snake. It's coming this way. Drive. And she became utterly hysterical. So I did this. We were looking at the chameleon over there. There was the chameleon, and I went like this because I was now in a. I was, well, slightly irritated. I started the engine, I went like this. At which point the tracker basically fell out of the car because he was laughing so much. And. As I slowed down, she says, Why are you slowing down? They're coming, they're coming! So I eventually stopped, I don't know, some distance down the road. There's some uh, zebras in front of us. I'm going, they're going to be very frightened by the next bit of the story. So I stopped the car, calmed them down. I said, Now look, I promise you there was no stake. And the son said, I also saw the snake, Mom. I saw it. And so I said, Really? He said, the snake I saw was green. And she said, oh my God, there were two of them. The snake I saw was gold with black stripes on it. So instead of thinking the obvious, which was, oh, then there wasn't a snake, Mum goes, oh my God, there were two snakes chasing us down the road. Drive, drive, get us home. And that's my story of the guests. <laughs> there are the zebras. Very nice. <laughs> and I know many of you have tried and been very kind to try and get hold of my books in the United States. I've spoken to the publishers, but I'm afraid it's just not worth their while to send the printed versions to the States. Um, and it would be rather expensive if I was to try and sort of package them and send them from Hootspreit. Uh, if you really want them, I suppose I could do that, but I'm afraid it would cost you probably a lot more than they're worth. If you want to read them, your best option, I'm afraid, is the digital version. And, well, you know what, you could wait too. I had some feedback yesterday from my publishers. I've just done an audiobook version of the first book. And there are one or two more edits that we have to do. And then you can, <laughs> you can have me read it to you if you like. So that's an option too. Otherwise, you need to be on Kindle, I'm afraid. Because I've, I've tried and failed to get them sent in print version to the United States. I think you will find the story of the two snakes in that book, amongst many others. <laughs> I'll tell you another one just now too, if you want. Um, driving over leopards, you want to know if leopards give birth more than once a year. Uh, not leopards, uh, zebras. Given their gestation period, they cannot give birth more than once a year. They have a gestation period driving over leopards, which is a slightly disturbing Twitter handle. They have a gestation period of about 11 months, which means they can only give birth once a year, pretty much. <clears throat> and, yeah, that's what it'll be. I think you'll probably find that they give birth to two foals every three years or so. So they have, no, no, I'm talking rubbish. They probably give birth to two foals every four years because they take a little bit of, little while to wean. So every three and a half years, probably two foals or so. But it is a long gestation. It's 11, 11 months, which is quite a lot longer than other animals of the same size. I mean, they're a little bit heavier than our heaviest antelope. A big zebra stallion will weigh 350 kilograms and that in pounds is about 900 pounds so it's, well 300 800 pounds it's a heavy animal and so they do take a little bit longer gestation wise <laughs> Do 
Judy H, I'm so sorry I used your name because I don't, I mean, I didn't really mean to. It's just the first one that popped into my mouth. You say, you say, <laughs> on behalf of all Judy's, you want to <laughs> disclaim any relationship to, oh my God, Judy from New York. Well, Judy H, I would never compare someone of your vast uh, <laughs> natural knowledge with Judy Smith from New York, she who was chased by the gold and striped snake as well as the green one. <laughs> All righty then, let's carry on down the road here. Riker, I think you might be right. You say a good safari, a good book name would be Confessions of a Safari Guide. Indeed. Uh, a friend of mine said Fifty Shades of Khaki might be quite a good uh, book for me to write. Um, I don't think that I'm going to write that book, though. Certainly not from first hand, anyway. Let's just pop down Hyena Road here and see if we can't find any lion tracks. If we don't, I'll tell you another one of those ridiculous stories. And Rob in Liverpool, very good question. You say, have I ever had anybody try and depart the safari vehicle while on safari? Um, yes, I have. Uh, people do that sort of thing, especially if they drop something out of the car. So if you stop next to a lion pride and they take out their cameras, then often it's normally, in fact, it's normally a lens cap that will be dropped. And you'll be talking, the lions will be there, you've got your guest set up there, everything's textbook perfect, and you're talking about the lions, and you hear a ta tang tang you look behind you and there's a guest scrabbling around in the bushes looking for his lens cap just outside the car. You say, what are you doing? Get in the car! And they stand up and look surprised. And thankfully, I mean, this chap who I'm talking about was on the right-hand side of the car and the lions were on the left and so they didn't kind of uh, react him. They didn't notice. They were all fast asleep. And people do that kind of ridiculously stupid thing. And the interesting thing is then you have to be quite rude. Now these are people paying top dollar for, the com for your company, for you to guide them. And sometimes you've got to be quite firm. And I remember we had a, uh, while well, we look at this Impala glorifying in the gorgeous golden light, as the sun begins its inexorable sink towards the west, um, a German fellow who came on safari and his camera bag consisted of a number of plastic bags. Now you all know that it is completely impossible. You've all tried to eat potato chips quietly. It's not possible. You've all tried to pull things out of plastic bags quietly and it simply isn't possible. Anyway, we were at a leopard sighting. There was a leopard in the tree above us and it wasn't very relaxed. It was quite nervous and it had sort of climbed up a tree. I'd parked under the tree not knowing where its kill was and the leopard came towards us and then went up into the tree and then then only did we notice the kill and I'd parked um, closer than I would have if I'd known that it was been, had been in the tree. Anyway, this fellow then began to take his camera equipment out of these plastic shopping bags and the leopard did not enjoy the sound of the crinkling packets and it started to growl. So I turned round and I said, oh, sorry, um, Hans, uh, could you, could you just, shh, just, you know, just, just be quiet. And I put my, my finger to my lips and the rustling ceased and then it began again. And the leopard began to go, and I said, Hans, please stop that. But I want to take a picture of the leopard. So I said to him, yes, but the leopard is cross. You can't make a noise. You need to be quiet. Yeah, he says. Silence. Leopard relaxes, begins to eat. And then the inexorable rap rapping of the, or the rustling of the papers began again. And the leopard stood up and went, Arr! like that to us. And Hans went, Arr! dropped all his things. And I said, oh, stop it. Put it down and don't move again. And he looked at me like this and he said, but I want to take a picture of the leopard. 
And I said, well, the leopard doesn't want you to take a picture of her. And we left. Now, this poor fellow, of course, was paying for my company. But you have to be like that sometimes, otherwise people will get themselves into quite a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I don't know that his name was Hans, actually. <laughs> Hello, Gracie, aged nine. Uh, were nine and two days. You say you found that snake story funny. Well, thank you very much, Gracie. And you also say that you find snakes quite scary, but you promise not to tell me if you ever see one. I don't mind if you see a real snake and you say you're scared. That's absolutely fine. But when you imagine a snake and say you're scared and make me drive away very fast, well, then I'm going to tell stories. Now, there's a vulture up ahead. There's a vulture flying away up ahead. I don't know what it was looking at, but it seems to be on its own and therefore unlikely to be surrounded by a great pride of lions devouring a giraffe. <laughs> Riker, yes? You, some guests do indeed get mad if you don't find the animals that they want to see. I have another story for you. We were, um, we were down the road, seven kilometers down the road at Londolozi, and I was enjoying a, what I felt. Oh, Brian, is it? Is it? Is it, Brian? Could it be? No, it's a vulture. Every bird I see now, I think, could it be the Wahlberg's eagle that I failed to find? That is a vulture. Wahlberg's eagle, everybody, the, one of the first migrants back, and they should be back by now. I think it's probably just my poor observational skills that uh, have precluded us seeing one just yet. You know, mate, that's a vulture, very high up, enjoying a spectacular view of the low felt. Now, Riker, um... <laughs> What was the story? Oh, yes. Right, so I was having a night off, um, and of course there's nothing lazier in the world than a safari guide, by the way. So we often, we always think that we're tired, and we always think we deserve time off. There's very little in the world um, that is lazier. So I was being lazy, and decided that I was going to have a nice night off, and then suddenly there was a knock on my door, and there was a panicked sort of camp manager there saying you have to come and drive because there's been a complaint about this ranger and his guests were demanding another ranger and the ranger in question who'd been complained about I knew to be one of the most professional one of the most competent one of the most sensitive and I just thought this I mean twice the guide I ever was so I thought this was a bit odd anyway they took he was just quite young so he didn't really know how to handle I think the, the these guests so I went down and I met these people who I was going to take out in the morning. And this chap looked at me, you know, he was a kind of fellow who you immediately dislike on sight because he looks at you as if you are his servant, which I suppose is a guide, some, you are in some ways, but you know, by and large people are quite interested in what you have to say if they've taken the time and trouble to come to a safari lodge. Anyway, this guy looks me up and down once he says, he was right from the east end of London, he says, is you our new, is you our new driver? So I said, um, well, I'm your new guide, yes. He says, right, well, I came here, I came here to see a kill, right? I've seen kills on a TV, I came here to see a kill. I told my guide today, I said, look here, I want to see a kill. The guide says he's going to do his best to find a kill for us, right? Did he find the kill? No, he didn't. So I'll come back here and i say, where, where, where's the kill? Why didn't you show us the kill? And he says, well, he says, I, I think it's totally unacceptable. I come here, I pay all this money, and now I want to see a kill. I bring my girlfriend here. She also wants to see a kill. And we ain't seen a kill. We see nothing here. All we've seen is some elephants, some rhino, a couple of buffalo, and some lions lying on the ground. I want to see a kill. So I looked at this fellow and I said, well, there's some... Vultures coming off the ground there. That could be where that buffalo kill was. 
Just one second, I will get back to my story. Did you go in there, Brian? Was that where it was? Let's just go back there and see if those lions aren't there. Brian will guide us in, I hope. Was it from here? Was it from... Yeah, it from From here. But it's a long way from there. Is it? Long way, okay. Well, let's just keep going around the, around the place here. Uh, so I said to him, well, you know, it's not unusual. It's very, I've been working in the bush now for close on 10 years. I've seen maybe three or four kills in my time. He said, oh, don't give me your stories. I don't care. I want to see a kill. And his girlfriend at this point, who has got more makeup, or more paint on her face um, than a sort of your average house, uh, so, and she's also got, I think she's probably had the early, you know, Botox wasn't much of the rage back then, but she's had quite a lot of the early form of it. So her face was completely immobile. She was unable to move. And so through these lips that uh, the good Lord did not give her, she said, I also want to see a kill. I came here to see a kill. We haven't seen a kill. We need to see a kill. So I thought I understood what she meant. And I said, well, we'll do what we can in the morning. This was after the evening game drive. So off we went in the morning. And it was beastly hot. Beastly hot. We saw one Stienbock, one Diker, and that was all in four and a half hours of game drive. Well, the red-faced, angry irritated East Ender I think left the lodge if I'm not mistaken that very day complaining deeply and he actually I think he did pay his bill but there was one incident with a guest who refused to pay his bill because he had not seen a white rhino he said your brochure has got a white rhino on the front of it. I came here, I didn't see a white rhino on, the front, in, on my safari, so I, I'm paying, I'm paying my bill. That's false advertising, that is. You can't put that on your brochure, not show people, I'm not paying for nothing. Uh, I think he was threatened with legal action and eventually did pay. <laughs> Those are my, my guest stories, which could probably, if you get two guides around it, if you get two guides around a fire, you will hear these things going on and on and on. And Alex, you want to know how often we get to see predators on the hunt? On the hunt, not uncommonly. Actually killing? Very uncommon. We don't see it a lot. It often happens at night. And you know, I often think that our presence at a hunt um, really does make a, have a negative effect on the animal's ability to hunt because we make a noise. You start the engine, and an impala will just look up like that, even if they're not particularly alarmed. And they're going to see whatever it is you're following. Right, now let's just try and figure out what happened here. Brian, you say they're in here somewhere, huh? So do you think it's... Well, there weren't any lions on it when you left it last. And I just see some vultures coming off the ground there. Just wondering where those lions have gone. Now, I think somebody did check it this morning, everyone, so I don't think we're going to go in there. There were no tracks from Hyena Road going in. So let's go to Bifflesook Dam and see what we can spot through there. It's not too far from here. Thank you very much for your screenshots of my facial expressions. Thank you, Brian, for uh, focusing on my appalling face. You are very well. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> we also often used to get asked, who is the worst nationality to have on drive with you? And everybody who isn't American immediately expects you going to say Americans. Universally not the case. Uh, we found South Africans to be the most uh, difficult guests to have, mostly because they thought they knew everything and seldom knew anything at all. And most of the American guests we had out here were, I would say, by and large, highly educated, well-informed, and they wouldn't have been here, you see, if they had been otherwise. 
So I know that our vast majority of our audience, our viewers, are Americans. And you can rest assured that your countrymen, when they came out here, apart from uh, being rather amusing, as was the case with the snake lady, um, they were by and large extremely pleasant human beings with a pretty good knowledge of the wild. <laughs> I thought I'd better throw that in there because sometimes I, sometimes I use the, use, attempt to use American accents. Tony, you want to know about the ostrich situation? Have we managed to find any yet with our attraction method? Uh, for those of you who don't know what Tony's talking about, uh, Hayden taught us a an, e an emu attracting technique where you lie on the ground and kick your legs in the air and apparently the emus come and indeed there there is a video of them on YouTube being attracted by a guy doing that. Oh, and it was, it was actually Tony who asked Hayden, I believe. So, Tony, you asked Hayden. I don't think he tried it with any ostriches. Um, I haven't actually seen any ostriches to try it with. We did do it the other day just by way of demonstration and practice on cheetah planes. So if we see them there, I'm almost certainly going to get out of the car and do the attraction dance. And the reason that I say almost certainly, the only thing that will stop me doing that is the presence of other vehicles because I fear me were you to be a guest from Cheetah Plains and some imbecile from Wild Earth were to come along, get out of the car and start kicking his legs in the air, I imagine you might lay a complaint fairly shortly thereafter. I don't really want a phone call from Graham Wallington saying, did you lie on the ground and kick your legs in the air in front of an ostrich sighting on Cheetah Plains? If the answer to that question is no, then you don't mind the question, but if the answer is yes, it will probably be followed by a very severe reprimand. Hello, Linda. <laughs> you say... How, you're wondering how many years of this wondrous show you've missed. And it depends entirely on how many years you've been watching for. We've been going for nine years. I've only been here 18 months. Brian, you've been on and off for three years. But it hasn't been nine years continuously. As far as I understand it, there have been kind of seasons, basically. Probably three months at a time, I think it started off as. And then... And I think it's probably must be around about this month, going two month that it's been going two years permanently. Uh, October. October yeah. for two years permanently. So in October, everyone, it will be two running every single day, which I think is a wonderful achievement. And you know, we do want to grow the audience. We love our audience, but of course, the more people that watch, the longer we're going to be able to do. Sorry about this everybody, perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over. Uh, hello everybody, sorry about that, we went through Nyala Road North Dip, and then as we got picture back I was quickly gargling some salt water, which you didn't need to see, and so we held you off for a few seconds longer, but here you are. We're heading towards Biffles Hook Dam, in the hopes of finding something there. It's been a little bit... <laughs> scarce on the animal front today. Brian, we have seen buffalo. We have an impala. An impala. Yala. Yala. Some birds. Some birds. 
cooking. It's been cooking, and a diker remained the diker and an unidentified spotted yet yellow cat. The mystery animal. The mystery spotted yellow cat. Brilliant. Which will haunt us for the rest of our days. All right, let us continue along to the dam. Martin, you want to know if I've ever seen a crocodile on drive? Um, I'm going to say yes, I have. I mean, you mean at Juma, obviously. Uh, at Londolozi, where I used to work, and at Angala, further north, there was a bit more water, and so we used to see crocodiles regularly. I've seen one crocodile here, and that was in Sydney's dam at a vast distance. Some people still uh, dispute whether I saw the crocodile or not. Um, I am convinced that I did see it. Uh, but it's not common here. They have seen once or twice here in Bifflesook Dam. Uh, you very unlikely to see one now because there's not much water. But they've increased the size of the dam substantially over the last sort of few months. And I think when the d predicted deluge arrives, it would not be surprising every so often to find a crocodile in a water source like this. They move quite big distances between... Lion! Yes, please! Brian, don't leave me hanging, thank you. <laughs> Hello, lion. Thank goodness for your presence. We couldn't have seen this lioness, surely. <sighs> All is right with the world. Hello, you beautiful woman. Isn't that lovely? Let's keep watching. I'm just going to call her in. Stations one line is Bifflesook Dam mobile in a southerly direction. We will try and follow up. I have done Hyena Road. She's calling, she's calling. I don't know what she's calling. Now, I'm going to excuse the noise already because it's going to get noisy if we try and follow her through there. Negative got the animal, but she's now mobile southwest into some thick bush. Oh, much tree on the termite mound there, down the other side. Sorry, go again with that oh, uh, text. Watch out there, everybody. Yeah, she's calling, so I think there are others around here. Negative, now west. Can you see anything, Brian? I can't believe this. Surely our afternoon with the lioness cannot be op over. Ah, a comment from Kirsten Max Smith in the final control who says Catterday has been saved. Indeed, Catterday has been saved. Have you got it? Well done, Brian. With the cubs. Oh, you're a genius. We may not have any signal here. Brilliant. Yeah, tax, she's here. We've got her with the three youngsters. Um, which is quite thick bush and they do seem to be mobile. Oh, isn't that lovely? Okay, she's calling. I've just got to try and get tax into this sighting. That's fantastic, isn't it? The three little ones. These are the three littlest ones. Two males, one female. She's calling something or someone. Let me move forward. Sorry, everyone. Now, stations, this is not going to be an easy place to get into, um, but you're welcome to try. Best approach at the moment is to come from the dam 
um, and you'll see my tracks going off on the northern, uh, sorry, the southern side of the main drainage. And you'll see my tracks going in there, just follow along there. So everybody's now trying to get in here. Oh, look at them! And Tax says that the tracks of her are coming from the north. Maybe she's left them from there. They're going to come straight past the front of us now. Look. They're looking very skinny suddenly. They were looking very fat the other day. That's normal. Yeah, affirmative. One. There are four cubs there. Five cubs. There are five cubs there, everybody. These are not the little ones. Sorry, I didn't even notice that. All right, they've gone down into this big drainage now. That's why they look a bit skinnier. They're, not, they're the same ones we had the other day. Oh, there they, okay, so there are three with her now, four with her now, and one in front of us. I'm just going to try and get Tex in here. Tex, are you on my tracks? Okay, she's lying down now. Now we can move a bit and get into a decent position. The four of them are there. I think, what do you think, Brian, from the top there maybe we'll get a good view. Yeah. I have now cannot hear the game drive radio. Hmm? She's moving. Stations, these. Brian, uh, Brian, Brian, Brian. Uh, she's now going up into the drainage. Standing by yours? Yeah, I'll wait. <laughs> Brian, what do you think? I think it's doable. You think it's doable, okay, well. Here we go, everyone. These are strychnos trees, don't worry about them. I'm caught again. The radio's not working. These poor guys are trying to get hold of me. Yeah, there we go. Where they gone? Sorry guys, my radio is really struggling here. Um, tax, they're now mobile into the drainage to the south of the dam, the main drainage. Um, they might be coming towards the dam. They are coming towards the dam and it's five youngsters and the one female. Okay, I'll try to go around. Yeah. All right, thanks, Jim. Tax, you'll get them from the dam wall. Yeah, I'll go onto the dam wall and wait there, guys. 
I'm astounded we still have signal. This is absolutely incredible. Isn't this fantastic? <laughs> we are so lucky to have got in here. There they go. No, I don't think we can get out here. We're not going to have long in here, everybody. There are about 7,000 people who want to come and share Catter Day with us. Andrew, where are you? No, Andrew, Andrew, where are you now? I'm in the cheetah plane of the van. I'm coming with. Confirm cheetah planes? Sorry, everybody. Just trying to. I'm in the cheetah and the cheetah and the van. Okay, copy that. Just make your way straight in. I'll pull out for you. Okay, anybody else who wants to come and have a look, I think the sighting will be closed in the next half hour or so. If you want to come and have a look, I'll move out for you. Uh, just in the drainage line here, everybody. There we go. Well, as soon as it's dark, we can't put light on them. <sighs> Sometimes... Oh, and they're calling now. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Sorry about the radio, it just is... Nobody's seen any cats today. Oh, look at the, all of them. I'm sure they're going into Buffles Hook. I wonder if there isn't a kill inside Buffles Hook, everyone. Stations on standby. Make your way straight here. We'll make space for you guys. Um, they're going to go north, probably into Buffles Hook fairly soon. So we're not going to have long, I'm afraid, but that's okay. You can see she's lactating heavily. I don't know where that we still haven't seen the female with the three smallest cubs for a few days. Last station, go again. No problem. You may also hear the machine gun fire of uh, cameras on the vehicle next to us. <laughs> There's some lenses there, everybody, that could take a picture of these cats from Houston, Texas, and still get a full frame shot. Now look, remember we were talking about the camouflage earlier on today. Just look how incredibly well coloured they are. I'm afraid I think this is probably going to be our last view. Well, no one else is here for now, so I think we can probably carry on. How are you? Good. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. <laughs> That's a 
guest in Biffle's Hook, who we know quite well, who says that she finds the program rather addictive. I think this might be our last view, everyone. Stations, these animals are now mobile north from the dam wall into the block. Four. Yeah. Aubrey, what's your position? Sorry, chaps, I'm sorry about the radio. It just has to be managed quite carefully. Oh, there's a hippo in the dam. Okay, we're going to pull out because we're not going to be able to see them again before somebody else gets in here. Copy, I'm going to leave the sighting with tax and uh, Buffalo's Hook Station there. Uh, Aubrey and Mike moving in. <coughs> Hooray! Well done, Brian. I think we just made everyone's day. There is a there is a hippopotamus. Wasn't that nice, everyone? Oh, I understand now why my radio wasn't working. Um, my radio wasn't working because my brain is very small, and I managed to pull out my earpiece, which is why Louise has been deadly silent. Louise, I'm back. Uh huh. Sorry about that. Well, um, <laughs> and there's a lapwing and little babies. Can you see the babies? Two baby lapwings. Do you think they're stalking that hippo? Now, I believe that some of you know that there are Safari Live ve viewers on Taxon's vehicle and what a joy it is for them to see these animals that they follow every day live. Just brilliant stuff. And I'm so glad that they've managed to see them live. Now, we can see the baby lapwing there, just moving beautifully camouflaged, stalking the hippopotamus. I'm so glad we sorted out the problem with why the radio wasn't working. Um, it wasn't the radio at all, of course, my brain. I can only see one. Can you see the other one, Brian? No, maybe I was mistaken. Well, I mean, they are the size and colour of elephant dung. And there, hang on. Yeah, I can only see the one, everyone. Maybe they've lost one already. Oh, well, I'm just sort of, my heart is still sort of calming slightly after she went to fetch those cubs. I think, unfortunately, she, well, she's definitely taken them into Buffalo's Hook now, and I suspect quite strongly that they've got a kill there, which is good for them. I do wonder where our other one is, though, our other female with the smallest cubs. Hello Donna. You want to know how many birds make nests on the ground? You don't really understand why they do it. Um, well, the Franklins make nests on the ground. All of the lapwings and the plovers and the coursers make nests on the ground. Guinea fowl make nests on the ground. And they all have I think there are probably a few others that I'm leaving out, but they, these things all have uh, one thing in common, Donna, and that is that they cannot perch. Bless you, Brian. Brian just, just coughed up a lung there. Um, they have one thing in common, and that is that they cannot perch. So that bird there, the lapwing, has adapted to being able to run on the ground, and they run on the ground and catch insects on the ground. That's called coursing. Now, to all, in order to do that, they have had to sacrifice. Look at them; ch they chase those little 
three banded plovers. They don't like them. Woo! The tiny little three banded plover is being harassed by that lapwing. Um, that lapwing does not have a hind toe, and so they cannot perch. Now, obviously, the um, the advantages of being able to perch have been outweighed, at least the advantages of being able to course after their prey on the ground have been outweighed by the disadvantage of, disadvantages of being able to perch. If you cannot perch, you cannot put a nest in a tree. It's not possible. And so what you find is that these little things obviously build their nests on the ground, but they are so well camouflaged that you, I mean, we, we had that amazing example of the course on the ground today. There'll be eggs in that little nest. And they're so well camouflaged and so well hidden from smell and all that sort of thing that you find it still is a highly successful strategy. So I, I know it, um, I, sort of at face value, it seems very strange that a bird would choose to put its eggs on the ground. But it actually works very well. And now, Fiona, you say, is this blacksmith lapwing also known as a blacksmith plover? Yes, it used to be. Um, they don't call them plovers anymore because they are from a slightly different lineage, lineage to that three-banded plover. So the little ones, the white-fronted, and, you know, there are a whole lot of different kinds of plovers. White-fronted, we get here, we get the kitlets here, we get the um, three-banded here. They're much smaller than these things. Uh, they're now called lapwings as are the crowned lapwings, for example, and the Senegal lapwings, which all used to be called plovers, but they're now called lapwings, just to distinguish them from the much smaller plovers. Lovely sighting. But I think I might have recovered sufficiently in order to be able to drive on. I'm just going to put on my jersey, Brian. It's getting a little cold, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. If you would like to take a moment to put on your jersey, please feel free. Of course, we can't go across to Brent to put our jerseys on, so you might have to just uh, be patient with us for a second. I just wish you could have heard, everybody, how the radio exploded to life like a Metallica concert in full flow as we found those cats. <laughs> It was quite terrifying. Everyone was desperate for Catterday to live up to its name. Right, now the sun's gone down, everybody, and as you know, we don't look at young cubs after sunset, and Brian, we probably also shouldn't look at young plovers either, should we? No, we need to move away, give them their space, let them have a good evening on their own. Let us continue. Hooray. I feel deeply satisfied now, deeply satisfied. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why I feel so deeply satisfied. There was zero skill involved in that. It was entirely by blind luck that we saw those lions. But we'll take it with both hands. <laughs> Just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So much of this game is about doing that. Just looking there. No, those are guys who are leaving the sighting, I think. But there are the viewers, everybody. They're on those two cars, on the one on the left. And one of them said to me as we drove past, she said, I'm just telling all that they can stop there. Go for it, I'm on my way out. Um, <laughs> one of them said to me, she looked at me and she said, you know, I found Karula yesterday. So I said, oh, well, well thank you for finding Karula. Could you do it again today? And she said uh, she'd try her best, but hasn't managed just yet. Velma and Valerie on Taxon's vehicle. And I certainly remember those names. And it's so, I, I tell you, it's, it gives me a real kick 
whenever we drive past, it's normally a, um, they, it's unusual to find them here. They're normally at Cheetah Plains or at Arethusa because you have to book the whole camp if you come and stay here. But it always gives me such a kick to go past and somebody says, you see them waving from miles away because it's like you with these people every single day. And yeah, they've become friends who you've never met before. So it's always lovely to have somebody waving and saying hi to you from the back of another vehicle. All righty. Janine in Washington State. I mean, I could try and dredge some up, I suppose. You say, do I have any stories about guests from whom I learnt quite a lot? Um, any stories about my favourite guests? Um, Janine, I do. Uh, I'm not sure that they'll be quite as amusing as the stories I told you earlier on. But, you know, I learnt something from just about every single guest I ever had. Um, well, here's one that sticks out in my mind. We had um, a situation where we had a big group coming in from Coca-Cola in the States and they came in to they came in to the lodge and I was uh, my guest climbed on and the CFO was there and he was a black man and I assumed he was a he was an African American. So I said to I made some sarky quip in Shangan to our, to my tracker and Elvis and I had a big giggle. And this guy responded in fluent Shangan. And he was the CEO or CFO of the group. So, I mean, he was the, he was the, he was the big cheese of the group. And he'd grown up in the area, in this area, right here, and emigrated sort of during apartheid and made a huge success of himself in the States. And I'd assume, just assumed that he was an African-American and he was a South African, which is why they ended up where they did. Anyway, over the course of the next four days, he took it in very good grace, the quip that I'd made, and I was very embarrassed, as I should have been. And he took it upon himself to teach me all sorts of things about the bush that he had learned when he grew up living in Bushbuck Ridge around this area. So that was a, that's a, a wonderful memory I have, mainly because he taught me never to take things at face value, people especially. And he taught, I mean, quite apart from the practical things that he taught me about uh, the plants that they used to use. It was like, you know how Herbie teaches us every time we go out and drive with him? This chap did the same thing. It was amazing. So that's one story. I'm trying to think of some of the others. And it was, it was just so deeply embarrassing <laughs> to start with. But he was very kind about my... Uh, inappropriate young man's speech. I suppose I least, at least I said it vaguely in a language that um, was unusual to hear a white man speak. What else can I tell you about guests that I have learnt from? I used to have one or two families who would come through um, and request me and so we'd, I'd always drive them and that was always special you know uh, it was always then then you really developed a friendship with with people and I, I used to love driving there was an old couple from the United Kingdom called the Corns Terry and Andrew and Terry and Andrew used to come out every so often and it was like it was like meeting a sort of um, a, an aged aunt and uncle who would uh, it, they just felt like almost like home you know because you met them every so, uh, so often and spoken on on email and written letters Terry used to write letters to me on uh, in the days when email was uh, absolutely the part of the thing people had stopped writing letters for years and she used to write me these long um, airgram letters you know those airmail things that you sort of fold up the envelope and paper in one that was wonderful always and then I'd reply with email because <laughs> The concept of sending a letter had uh, long since left me. So I used to learn quite a lot from them. And I used to love, you know, when, we had, when I had nice guests, I used to really enjoy sitting around the table with them at night time and finding out where they were from, you know, different parts of the world. And if they were forthcoming, it was always great to sit and talk to them about where they were from. Especially, you know, the thing that people ask you when they come out here uh, is, you know, 
it's almost always what is your favorite animal what have you uh, how do you train to do what you do and you know what's your, what's your job like kind of thing those are the sorts of um, questions we used to get asked and yeah I mean you, you always don't you never mind answering them but it's always nice to have people who you could question it was always quite nice after you know a game drive like this where you've been talking and presenting and showing people this and that and the next thing it's always very nice to have um, the opportunity to quiz people from around the world about where they lived and the nature especially uh, in the places they live there's a drongo and we're into that stage of the day now of course the changing of the guard and the drongos are making their late evening calls <laughs> and while we listen to that bird making that call. I remember once I was playing the guitar for some guests and all of a sardine, a trumpet began playing. And I looked behind me and my guest had brought out a trumpet, <laughs> unannounced, and there he played with me. And he turned out to be a kind of really superstar New York jazz musician so I mean I quickly retired and just let him pl play because he was so fantastic those are the kinds of experiences that were just fantastic and I'll remember forever um, then a question about from James Taylor an appropriate name for a musical conversation although your question has nothing to do with music you want to know about hummingbirds and whether we get them here we don't we get something called a sunbird, and on account of the fact that there's nothing else to show you right now, I'm going to show you a picture of a sunbird. James, we get lots of colourful sunbirds that look very similar to hummingbirds, but are not the same, because um, hummingbirds have evolved in a different place, but to ac accommodate or to take advantage of ecological conditions that are similar to the ones that there are here. I'm going to have to look this up in the... I'm looking under H for hummingbird, which of course we don't get here. Sunbird 14. Okay, and so they look very similar to the hummingbirds, but they're not related. And there they are, That's some of them. And they don't hover quite as well as your hummingbirds, but you, they do drink nectar, and that's why they've got those long bills, which of course all the hummingbirds do. Beautifully coloured birds. They're a bit bigger than most of the hummingbirds, I think. They're certainly much bigger than, for example, the bumblebee hummingbird, which is the smallest hummingbird in the world. But you can see how stunning they are. Pretty, pretty birds. Very nice. It's a wonderful evening. Okay, let us continue. We might be lucky to see another cat on our way home to make it Cat a Day Squared, Brian. Oh, wonderful. wonderful, Cat a Day Squared. <laughs> yes, indeed. Ah, you know what? I was thinking about this earlier on. Cat, sorry, I've lost the name. Louise, go again with that. Catherine, yes, that's right. That's right. Catherine in Texas, you say, I was, what is my favorite spot on Juman? And I was thinking today, as a theme for a drive, it might be quite a nice idea to go from favorite spot to favorite spot, especially if you are not seeing much. Catherine, I know exactly where my favorite spot on Juma is. It is that when we can't get to it right now before the end of the drive. But it's that spot at the junction of Zoe's and Rebecca's Road where that big brown ivory is and it looks out west over the mountains and you can see the copies of Ulusaba and down all the way to the Drakensberg and it's the best western facing view that there is on this reserve and that's definitely my favorite spot on the reserve. I've sat there many times on my days off uh, reading, learning about bits and pieces, taking pictures, uh, none of which are worth showing you, but that is definitely my best spot. Then my second best spot, third best spot is just up here. We're going to have a look there. Then I would imagine my second best spot being many places in the Mulwati drainage. 
because they're just so deeply shaded and very beautiful. And as I've told many of you, I had an incredible experience the other day. Now this, this is an on-foot experience that I really like to share with people because it was so unthreatening, but it was so close at the same time. And I was sitting in the drainage system on a chair. I passed out in the middle of the day. I was just, it was quite, I was quite tired and it was a lovely day and I just dozed off. And I woke up thinking there's something amiss around here. And I looked up and six meters away, she'd just come across the drainage line and she was just looking at me like this was Karula. She was just looking. And as our eyes locked, she kind of looked. I like to think she actually nodded, but I don't think she did. And then she just walked gently off into the bush on her way to do her hunting. That for me is the ultimate kind of on foot experience where there's an acknowledgement a total lack of threat a total lack of conflict or engagement and then the animal moves off just brilliant brilliant stuff here are some kudu i was hoping to show you a bit of the drakensberg from here because this is my third favorite spot we're at now it's a nice viewpoint but there's so much haze and smoke so we're not going to be able to see the mountains Isn't that nice? <laughs> oh, Rebecca in Santa Barbara, California. A very interesting question from you. And I would like you to ask Brent Lear Smith the same thing the next time you see him. Your question is a good one. You say, do I ever get or miss meeting the constant flow of people, the you know, the ins and outs of new people every day. Do I miss that ever through a commercial tourism lodge? Rebecca, I don't miss it for one day. And it's because I found it exhausting. And that is nothing to do with the guests that I had because by and large, they were wonderful people who would taken the time and effort to come out to South Africa and I appreciated and still appreciate their presence and all they taught me. And I just tell those rather amusing stories because, well, they're the few and far between and they're quite funny. But largely they were great. But I found the activity of actually guiding people deeply exhausting. And it's because, and many of you are going to think this is a ridiculous statement, but I'm a tremendous introvert. I'm very shy. And what that means, many actors are actually, many people who like to perform are very shy. They're one-on-one. -on -one with people they find very difficult and it saps their energy and I definitely find that. So being a guide had a shelf life for me of about two years. Doing what I do now I far far prefer because there's a greater variety of conversation that we have. I suppose there is a separation between you and I uh, through the lens but I don't know I just find it easier uh, to do what I do now than meeting people constantly all the time and I think it's also got to do with the depth of knowledge that we're able to share with you our regular viewers because you know so much more and so the conversations we have tend to be that much more interesting. Now if you ask someone like Brent I'm not sure if he misses guiding but Brent is a brilliant guide you know Brent is a people person he's an extrovert he draws he draws his energy from um, meeting people and you can see it. I mean, whenever that he and I have been to a, I don't know, a social gathering like a wedding or something like that, um, he is front and center meeting new people and I tend to kind of go into the shadows a little. So it's quite an interesting thing that the two of us with our different personalities have ended up doing what we do here. So Rebecca, there's your answer. Let us continue, Brian. You see me sharing, bearing my soul there, Brian. Did you see that? Yes. Still haven't managed to cry yet. One day. One day. <laughs> now, apparently, Brian says to me, and I, we've said this, when did we explain this? The other night. 
The other night we explained, Brian explained, that you can't be a proper presenter until you've cried live on air. And I thought maybe I would cry there as I was bearing my soul, but I didn't. And so we're still going to have to make that happen at some stage. Let's go down here towards the Mlwati drainage. Let's see if we can't find Kurula there. Hello, Aqua from Honolulu. Aloha. You want to know what I like to know about my guests? Uh, well, depends entirely on the guests, Aqua. Uh, some guests I've wanted to know very little about. Indeed, their name was quite sufficient to put me off entirely. Others I've wanted to know quite a lot more about. For example, uh, one of the guests I had, uh, she and I struck up quite a, a firm relationship. And for many years, um, we were... Uh, we were sort of boyfriend and girlfriend actually. She lived in Colorado um, and it worked quite nicely because I'm only tolerable for about two weeks at a time after which I become deeply painful. So we'd see each other for two weeks and then sort of have three months off by which time um, she missed me again and we could see each other again. So that was the kind of spectrum Aqua. Um, but it really did depend on the people. What I really liked to know from people was whether they could give me some kind of life lesson, whether there wasn't, because I mean, many of the people we spoke to were, and who came on drives, because of the cost of the places where I used to work, they were highly educated, they were captains of industry often, and they had, uh, you often assumed that they would have some kind of interesting philosophy and take on life that you could learn from. And funnily enough, I remember being almost universally disappointed by the uh, you know the, the obvious philosophies, um, and so it was the it was normally the the others the the less captain of industry type of people from whom I got the most, and so I was always looking for some sort of gem of uh, life secret or life answer or some kind of little indicator or nugget, if you like, of information or insight into the human condition. And those are the kind of guests who I really enjoyed having. <laughs> I may have told you the story before, but I remember... <laughs> now, Snow, you say I've just made you feel good for feeling an introvert yourself. Well, Snow, I'm glad you feel good about being an introvert. I do too now. Uh, but it's amazing how many people, how many actors who you would imagine, and I mean, I'm in no way comparing myself with the great actors of the world, but um, if you name some of the, the actors you would imagine to have a really, oh, rock stars, for example, you, you would see on stage and you think, well, they must be the most extroverted person in the world. Often it's completely opposite. I remember the day we were talking about guests and doing what I do now versus driving guests. I remember the day that I realized that guests and I were no longer meant to be together. And I was, I may have told, I'm sure I've told you the story before, but if I have, if I have, you'll have to hear it again. And for those who haven't, well, here you go. I was standing on the deck where I used to work and we used to get these things called a cheat sheet. A cheat sheet was what the receptionist gave you when you came down to tea in the afternoon to meet your new guests and on your cheat sheet were the names of your guests so that when you were driving along and you'd forgotten what they were called you could just take it out and say well John um, yes indeed uh, that is a lilac breasted roller and mm, Lynn yeah absolutely you may borrow my binoculars here they are and then everybody thought that you'd remembered their names which in my case I almost inevitably forgot two seconds after I met them. Anyway, this receptionist gave me my cheat sheet. She said, there are your guests coming now. And they were walking down. It was an excited family in matching safari gear. I looked at them and I knew that I didn't want to meet them because it was just time for me to finish up being a guide. And from then on, I sought to uh, do something else which is when I went into the land management side of things and the conservation work and the research, which was very interesting. But I have to tell you, these last 18 months that I've been here, doing what I've been doing here, have unquestionably been the best 18 months of my bush career.
Right, Brent Leo Smith astoundingly is up and running. Let's go and say hello and possibly goodbye to him. Well, the good news is both James and I are done with this stuff, so you'll have us both out for the full drives on the Sunrise Safari tomorrow. Hopefully we'll have a little bit more luck with the leopards at least. And I hear James did find some lions at the Buffles Hook waterhole. Now we did have tracks around there, so I'm very happy that you did get to see some cats on Saturday, cat a day. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow and the Sunrise and Sunset Safari. And I do think there might be a fireside chat tomorrow. And uh, I don't know if you saw the wonderfully written blog by Rebecca, which was exquisite apart from one minor detail. Uh, the rules of the ranger race. Uh, Rebecca has invented a new bird, the Wahlberg's eagle owl. So I, 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 we do forgive her. It is of course meant to be a Wahlberg's eagle. If we discovered a Wahlberg's eagle owl, we would have discovered a brand new species to science. So maybe Rebecca is preempting our ranger race to discover a new species to science. And uh, if so, well, congratulations, Rebecca. So it has been a, an interesting afternoon for us. And uh, I always struggle with the non-live stuff. But uh, it's all done, and hopefully it's going to look wonderful and beautiful. And now the next thing, fingers crossed for today, is that the mighty South African Springboks are playing against Argentina. So we've put it on record, and James and I are going to watch it uh, as if it were live, which we are now. And speaking of James, uh, VM and I say goodbye, and let's send you back across to him. I just want to quickly show you the pinkening sky before we say goodbye, everyone. There it is. Very beautiful. With a star up above it. Do you know what that star is, Brian? Uh, Venus. I'm assuming it's Venus. I don't know for sure, though. Marvellous. I shall try and take a picture of it. No, it looks dreadful. Hello, Levin, you very hilarious human being. You say, <laughs> basically, this has been a, a philosophari. Well, I suppose it has been something of a philosophari. Thank you, Niven. <laughs> Let's continue home. One last little pass through Ingwe Alley to see if Karula isn't around. But I fear me, someone would have found her by now. <laughs> A philosophari. Thank you, Niven. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you, Aaron, in New Zealand. You say. Friends you have never met describes very nicely the Safari Live community. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. Friends you've never met, and some of whom I've been very honoured to meet, of course, have come through here to see us. I hope many more of you will be able to do that over the years. Mostly, of course, I hope that you'll be able to come and see these places and animals, and long after Brent and Jamie and I and Brian and Viam and all the rest have moved on uh, or perhaps moved to different places. Uh, the animals of this great place will continue to create stories uh, that we just kind of interpret for you. And so regardless of who's here, I hope that one day you'll all be able to come up and visit this incredible place. We'll just go to the junction of Ingui Alley here and then we'll say goodbye to you. Right, Brian, I must thank you profoundly for placing the camera at my face for the whole of the day. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to your st stick man thumb there. Well done. A big thank you to all of you for your conversation and comment today. It really has been a great privilege to do this kind of solo drive. I hope that you have a wonderful evening or morning, wherever you are. We'll see you tomorrow at six o'clock.